Turn with me this morning to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. As we go into Mark chapter 16, I want you to look with me. Mark chapter 16. This is the last chapter of the book of Mark and the last verse in the last chapter of the book of Mark. In verse 20, it says, And they went forth. Now, somebody tell me, where'd they go? Come on, help me. Where'd they go? They went forth. They weren't going backwards. They went forward. So they went forth and preached everywhere. Now, these are some commands of the Lord. This is, this is, this is the, the Bible here. It says, and they went forth and they preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and, con look at this, confirming the word with signs following. Now, we are a church that believes in signs and wonders, miracles. We believe in miracles. Many churches don't follow the teaching of miracles. They say, well, miracles are good, but I'm not sure that's for today. But miracles are extraordinary events of divine nature, and we're supposed to draw on them. The Lord told us, he says, I want to use miracles to help establish my covenant. Now somebody said, well, I don't know how he's going to do that. All you got to do is have a couple of miracles go on and people want to come. They want to be a part of that. Hey, what's going on? You want to see what's going on in my church? They're having miracles over there. Really, what time does it start? Amen. People want to see a miracle. As a matter of fact, we're sitting in the meeting the other night. One of the young men looked up and he says, I just want to see a miracle. <laughs> I just want to see a miracle. Well, gosh, you know, people often cry out. They say, I haven't seen any miracles. But I don't know why I've seen hundreds of miracles. Because I'm believing in miracles. I want to see a miracle. And it's a miracle when people have a good relationship. And it's a miracle when they have their finances taken care of. And it's a miracle when their body's healed. And it's a miracle to see God working. I'll tell you what, it's a miracle. God often says this. He says, I'm going to show myself through miracles. He responds to us in our prayer life with miracles. Now, people say, I don't know how that works. Well, he responds to us because he loves us in our prayer life. We're saying, well, Lord, help me with this, Lord, help me with that. Sometimes people say, well, I haven't seen anything. It's been so long, and I've prayed for so many months, and nothing seems to be happening. But according to the word, it says, be unto you according to your faith. Let it be done unto you according to your faith. And many people have difficulty believing for something when they don't think it's of God. If they don't think healing is of God, or it's for today, don't be concerned. You're not going to have any of that happen. You're not going to have to be concerned. Is it going to be from God? Because it's not going to happen. Because you won't have faith for it. When people say, well, I don't know if everybody's supposed to have money, so I don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it because you're not going to have any. You're not concerned that God's going to give you money. Now somebody says, well, I don't know why he wants to give me money. Well, according to the Bible, Deuteronomy, it says this. He gives you wealth to help establish the covenant. Somebody says, well, I don't know why you should have so much money. Help establish the covenant. You said, I'm trying to get some money to you so you won't have to just put a buck in the offering. Mm -hmm. If you could put $1,000 in the offering every time you came, that would mean you were making at least $10,000 a week. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Somebody would say, well, now, I, I, I put it in the bag. <laughs> Can I play? You bet. And the Lord said, I want you to be able to give the offerings in such a way that you're not concerned is it going to affect me. He's wanting us to have miracles so that he can get the glory. Now I'm talking about miracles on purpose because God gets the glory in miracles. When miracles are going on, you can't say, well, I just did that. You can't say, well, look what I did. Because when it's a miracle, you say, I didn't have anything to do with that. That was the Lord right there. Anybody ever play that game, Jenga? Anybody ever heard of that game, Jenga? It's like a whole bunch of wooden pieces, and they're all piled up on each other, and it looks like a structure. Come on, you all with me? It looks like a structure. All the pieces are intricately woven together, and it looks like a little cube. Well, over the years, in years past, in decades previous, in some centuries that passed, even in millennia, people have looked at the Jenga cube of spirituality and the supernatural. And they said, if I pulled one out right here, will it still stand? Oh, looky there, it's still standing. It's okay. 
We just took that out of the church and it's still standing. It's no big deal. Hey, let's do it again. So they reach over to the Jenga cube and they pull another one out and it's still standing. They go, look in there. It didn't fall. Everything's okay. And they've been doing that for years and decades and hundreds and thousands and, and millennia. And people say, well, what's it look like today? It looks like a big old airy hole. And if we pull one more thing out, we might collapse the supernatural. I think that we've done God an injustice by pulling so much supernatural out of the church. Yeah. The way the early church was, there was always signs and wonders yeah. and miracles following the teaching of the word. But we say, well, maybe that's passed away. That's because you're holding on to a Jenga cube. Maybe it's time to put the cube back into the Jenga box and watch the whole thing come back together with the structure and the way God intended it to be. Amen. Yeah. Look with me in John chapter 8. Now, I'm a little bit stirred up about the things of the Spirit because I like miracles. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Look at John, chapter 8. John, chapter 8. And I want you to look with me at verse 28. John, chapter 8, verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, and he didn't say the Son of God, he said, the Son of Man, when you put the, the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. Now, you've got to understand something. Some people have been confused. When Christ came back to the earth, He was only Jesus at that time. He did not come back as the Christ. He came back as Jesus. Now, we call Him Jesus the Christ. And we understand he is the Messiah. But while he lived on this earth, he did it as a man. He gave up his deity. He took the form of a human. He made himself confined to all human characteristics because otherwise he couldn't go to the cross as God. He had to go to the cross as man because it was a substitution. As a man, he substituted his life for our life so that a sinless life would take the sin of the world and he could then substitute for all of us and be the very son of man, he would be Jesus the Christ. And he said, of myself, I can't do nothing because I'm a man. I can't do this by myself. And we should say unto God, I can't do this by myself. I am a man. I am a woman. I can't do this by myself. It's up to God. And this is what he said. I can do nothing of myself. I can't preach of myself. I can't do miracles of myself. And there's some churches that attempt to do some structural things because they don't have any Holy Ghost. And so they do structural things, not spiritual things, not supernatural things, because they don't see the fullness of how to get Christ or Jesus to be the Christ in their church. Amen. You've got to do the same. Now, he was God. But he chose not to use his Godhood. He waited till he was 30 before he started his earthly ministry. If he was God, why didn't he start at 10? Why didn't he start at 20? Because it wasn't just his earthly. He gave up his earthly ministry. He gave up his deity until he was baptized in the River Jordan. Anybody remember that? If you've read the story of him being baptized in the river Jordan, and somebody can just see him coming up out of the water, the water coming off of him, I mean, just pouring off, and all of a sudden from the heaven, there's a dove comes down in the form of a dove, it's the Holy Ghost, and it comes down and lights on him. And people say, really? Is that the beginning of his ministry? According to the Bible, that was the beginning of his ministry. How was that? He was filled with the Holy Ghost. He didn't do a single thing until he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He didn't preach. He didn't do one miracle. He didn't do anything until he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And somebody said, well, is the Holy Ghost for today? Of course he is. He was anointed by the Holy Ghost. And according to the scripture, the very first miracle he did, he did at Canaan. When he was there, and his mother was in charge of making sure the wedding was going well. And they ran out, ran out of wine. And they said, what are we going to do? And he says, uh, I got something in mind. And his mother said, whatever he says to do, do that. <laughs> there was no question. They went and filled up some big old pots with water and they brought them up there. And I'm sure he just kind of went, okay, that's that. And they began to pour it out and took it up to the guy that was running the wedding. And he said, man, this stuff is the best I've ever had. This is the best that, 
You've served all the good before, but this is even better. Because why? Because the first miracle, according to the scripture, was done at the wedding Cana. He did the first miracle. That was the beginning of miracles. And how did he do that? He did the miracles as a man. But he was full of the Holy Ghost. And he says, this is what I want from you. As a man full of the Holy Ghost. I want you to operate in the spirit. I want you to operate not just with structure. I want you to operate with power. With power. And Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. How did he say it? He said it like this. I have no supernatural capabilities on my own. I have no supernatural capabilities on my own. I have chosen not to walk in my deity. I am walking only in humanity. But I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Watch out now. Because yeah. oh. this is what he's telling us. We have been afraid. We have not stood up to the place that we should be. And that's why America has taken such a huge turn is because people don't stand their ground in where they're supposed to be. If we repent and turn from our wicked ways, he heal our land. Yeah. He'd take a hold of the whole thing and say, hey, wait a minute, you're making a move for me and according to the scripture, you make a move towards God, he'll make a move towards you. Right. You don't move, he don't move. Uh -huh. And you say, well, that's not right. Well, when you're God, you set it up the way you want it. Because right? <laughs> that's what he does. He says, I'm coming to take care of this and I expect you to do this. Now in John 14 and verse 12, it says like this. It says, you can do greater works than he does because he's going to decide I'm going to sit by my father. So I want you to do greater works than I've done. So he healed the sick and he raised the dead and he cast out devils. He said, I want you to do more than I've done. And we don't hear it that way. What we hear is, well, you know, he was God. He was God. And he could do anything he wanted. No, he didn't choose to do anything he wanted. He said, I can only do nothing. The things I do is nothing. I can't do anything except the Holy Ghost that works in me. And the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that same Holy Spirit dwells in you. It dwells in you. He says, I want you to have that same Holy Spirit. He says, it's supposed to quicken your mortal body. It's supposed to make you different than you've ever been before. You can't ignore what Jesus said. Of myself, I can do nothing. You can't ignore that. He says, of myself, I can do nothing. There was no healings. There were no deliverances. There was no one set free until he was filled with the Spirit. And he restricts himself to stand in the body of a human. The entire time he's on this earth, he walked as a human being. So that he could substitute on the cross as a human being. He was the son of man. He gave himself as a human being. So he took the sin of the world. Even though he was in the, in the form of a man, he was sure God, but he restricted himself from using any godly nature because he was a man. He substituted for us. At the tomb, you probably have read this, the angel appeared and he said to them, you seek Jesus. He didn't say you seek the son of God. You seek Jesus who is raised from the dead. It was Jesus, the man. There's only one advocate. There's only one place. There's only one person that can stand between us and God. It's the man, Christ Jesus. <coughs> Amen. So if you get this and understand this, he was only three years of his 33 years where signs and wonders followed him. And how did they do it? Because he was full of the Holy Ghost. He was full of the Holy Ghost. And what's he saying to us? Listen, I want the same thing for you. And we have pulled so many Jenga squares out of the pew that things just kind of dangle in there. We pull one more out and the church is just about to let all spirituality and supernatural go. They'll stand as a church, but they'll have no power. They'll have no way to go on with what God told them to do. In the New Testament, we're walking through the book of Acts. In the first chapter, he says to the disciples, go in there and tarry. Don't even leave. Don't even go. Don't start your ministry. Don't even turn it on. Don't even get excited about anything. Tarry until the Holy Ghost comes upon you. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, then you can go and do things. In my name, you'll cast out devils and speak with new tongues and lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. But in your, in your body, you can do nothing. Stay there. Tarry there until the Holy Ghost comes on you. Amen. Wow. That's pretty exciting. Now look with me in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Hallelujah. <laughs> Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse uh, 16. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. 
And it says it like this, and Jesus, when he was baptized, came up straight out of the water, and lo, the heavens opened up, and there came unto him the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit himself, descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and there was a voice from heaven that said this, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And they heard the voice. Let me ask you a question. How many sermons did Jesus preach at this point? God still said, please. How many miracles had Jesus done at this point? And God said, still please. What was he pleased with? That's my child right there. That's <laughs> my son right there. That's all he said. This is my beloved son. And that's what he's saying to you. Doesn't he call us the children of God? Yeah. Just because we're a son. He says, I'm telling you something. You're a woman and a man of God. You're a child of God. He says, I love you. Just because you're my child. You're my child. And I love you. Still. If this is, you've got to understand. Write this down. Our entire will being from God. The love of God. Calling us well. He says, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's not performance based. Right. Oh, hallelujah. It's not based on what you've done or what you said. It's based on your working with the Holy Ghost. And he said, all you've got to do is get if you come into my kingdom and you become my child. I'm pleased with you. Can you be more pleased? Oh, I got children. I'm pleased with them. But I'm more pleased with some. I'm already with me. <laughs> I'm well pleased with some just because of my child. Hallelujah. Now, we've got to understand, he's the son of God, but he's restricted that sonhood. He's a man. He's walking as a man. He can walk as a man. There's things that God has pleasure in. There's things that God has pleasure in. One, he wants us to be born again. When you're born again, you're automatically a child of God. Automatically, he says, I'm well pleased. But then there's a second step. He said, I want you to do some things. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Some people say, you mean that's a step of God? That was what Jesus did. He wouldn't even do a miracle until he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He wouldn't even preach until he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He told the church, don't you dare go out and get started until you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't do a single thing. And he's telling us today, you've got to be studying, doing the will of God. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll do the will of God. Amen. Now, some people say, well, I go to church. We have a church, that's good. But that's not what makes God go. Please, that's part of it. I mean, go to church, that's good. And win souls for the Lord. People say, well, I'm winning souls. Good, praise God, win souls. That's good. And, but Jesus loves you anyway. It's not performance-based. He died for you. Amen. Anybody remember the story of the guy with the talents? Yeah, this is a good story. The guy's got ten talents. And what do he do? He'd go out and amaze ten more. Right? So he's got 10 talents, and now he's got 10 more. And God says, whoa, that's good. And then he says to him, well done. Come on, come on, have a well done, good, faithful servant. Come on in and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. And then the guy has five, right? God has five. And he goes out and makes five more. And he comes back and he says, well, you didn't do as good as the other guy, but no, he didn't. He, he didn't say, you know, well or nothing you. You know, you didn't do as well as he didn't do any of that. He just said, well done, good, grateful servant. So it's not the amount of stuff you give to the Lord. It's what you do with what you have. Okay. Amen. Amen. It's not the bigness of it. What it is is the goodness of your heart. Did you give everything to it? And that's exactly what they're asking here. He is re relationship power. He wants us to be a child of God. Amen. Amen. And the Holy Spirit came on Jesus' humanity. It came on Jesus' humanity and filled him with power. Look with me in Acts chapter 10. Amen. Acts chapter 10. Hallelujah. Look at verse 37. Now, P Peter is preaching here, and this is recorded in, by Luke in the, in the books of Acts. But it's Peter preaching. And what's he say here in verse 37? He says it like this. Peter's preaching and he says, The word that I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea, and it began in Galilee after the baptism, this is of Jesus, after the baptism, 
which was by John, that John preached after Jesus was baptized, that's when the gospel started going out. Jesus preached after he got baptized. He said, don't get me wrong, you need to record this, and Peter preached this, there's no power at all, there's no work at all until you be filled with the Holy Ghost. It happened there at the River Jordan, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Get excited, listen to me, it happened there at the River Jordan. And people say, well, is that really what happened? Without the Holy Ghost, if you're preaching, it's just good talking. Right. Somebody said, God, listen, that bothers me when somebody says, Pastor, that was a nice talk today. <laughs> oh, did I do that bad? <laughs> I want people to go, whoa, I heard the Holy Ghost today. Then I go, well, I did my time in prayer just right, and the Holy Ghost got his way. Without the Holy Ghost, I'm not anointed. And without the Holy Ghost, Jesus was not anointed. We're anointed. And this is what he says in the next verse, in verse 38. He says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. If you want to get down to the human level, you get down to the human level. That's what God did. Got right down to the human level. He said, God anointed Jesus from his hometown of Nazareth. That's like saying, God anointed Michael from Bakersfield. Are you with me? This is where you're saying, man, that is as human as you can get. He's talking about human. He didn't say, I anointed Jesus from heaven. He said, I anointed Jesus from Nazareth. Yes. And he said, this is what I want you to see. There's no question, I'm not deity. Are you with me? You shouldn't be confused. Jesus didn't act in his deity at this point. He was acting as a man. Don't, don't, don't get it wrong. And then in verse 38, it goes on and says this. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went around doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. There's two phases to what Jesus did with his ministry. Two phases. And he says it right here in verse 37 and verse 38. One, he says he went out preaching, and two, he went out doing miracles. He was doing miracles. He was doing miracles. He was doing miracles. And that was the ministry of Jesus. He went around to get rid of all those that were oppressed of the devil. He went around doing miracles. Hallelujah. All those that were oppressed by the devil. Amen. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Amen. Come on, amen. Yeah. Go back to here. John chapter 3, look at verse 8. John chapter 3, verse 8. We're at the right place. That didn't look like the right place. Hallelujah.
bothers me. I've always read this one scripture, and it kind of goes like this. It says, Jesus was dealing with the blind man, and so he spit on him, and he made spit and put it on his eyes. And somebody says, that's gross. It is gross. In the Old Testament, spit was the lowest form of degradation. I looked up spit in the Bible. I said, now I'm a word man. Are you with me? And so I looked up things about the spit. And I have got into prayer this last week and talking to the Lord. And it must have been holy spit. <laughs> Surely it must have been holy spit that he put on the word man. And I was trying to think, well, what good could possibly be with the spit? The only thing I could think of, he didn't see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> so then I realized that he put the spit on the blind it's the lowest form of degradation I said Lord because I told my wife I told my wife last week I said Lord why did you say I, I bothered with this verse for a long time I said Lord why did you spit on the blind man and the Lord said very plain to me I didn't spit on the blind man I said, Lord, now, you know, I know they wrote it down. It's got two or three witnesses in there, but according to the word, you spit on the blind man. I said, why did you spit on the blind man? He said, I didn't spit on the blind man. I said, Lord, I'm going to tell you one more time. I've been a word man a long time. I'm finding that you spit on the blind man. He said, I didn't spit on the blind man. I spit on the blindness. You said, you foul thing that's interfering with his eyesight, I spit on you. I command you to stop it. And this gave a whole new meaning. I've been reading Smith Wigglesworth. I've got a whole bunch of volumes of Smith Wigglesworth. I'm looking through there and I find a certain thing in Smith Wigglesworth where he calls a woman up with a boiler on her stomach and she's got this thing and it's hanging off to one side and he walks up and slaps it. And I was so mad. I can't believe I read this in there. I, that, that bothered me. And somebody stood up in the crowd and said, You, you silly man, you have done a, a great harm against God. And he said, Shut up and sit down. I know what I'm doing. Because he was hitting the boiler, not the woman. I had no idea that God hates it so much, he's willing to slap it out. He doesn't want you to be blind. He doesn't want your feet to hurt. He doesn't want your back to ache. He wants your eyes to be clear. He intends to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. And so he said, this is what I intended. For this purpose, I was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And he said, now you can do the same works I do and greater works than these because they go to my father. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Quickly, quickly. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Look what it says in verse 1. In former treaties, how I made Philopolis. It says, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. He had two parts of his ministry, doing and teaching. Action and teaching. He was preaching and miracles. Amen. He said, this is what I called you to do. In the book of Acts, the entire book of Acts is the ministry of the disciples and we're to take up right where he left off. Hallelujah. He said, this is what I'm asking you to do. This is where the church began. They didn't do one single thing until they were filled with the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 2, and it said they heard a, a wind coming through, a big, mighty, rushing wind, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and this time did not sit like a dove. It sat like fire on their head because they were in a new ministry with a brand new thing. It didn't come as the Prince of Peace. They came with fire on their brow to destroy the works of darkness. Amen. He said, this is what I called you to do. In 1 John 3, 8, he said, I called you to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now this morning, I've got a whole bunch more, but the Lord says, I want you to stop. Let's stop. If we're going to do what the Lord said, then let's do it. This morning, he said, there's two things we're going to do before we leave. One, we're going to have communion, but he said, before we get into that, there's some people in here that have not yet been filled with the Holy Ghost. Not yet. 
It's the power of the Lord High. It's the, how he started his ministry. It's how the church got started. And he said there's no way that you can walk around without the power and get rid of the devil. Because you're saying, I, I, can, I can resist the devil. Yeah, but he's, he'll flee from you if you're full of the Holy Ghost because you're not by yourself. You're going, he says, well, what about you? He said, mm-hmm. And, and then he says, what what, 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 you, what what are we? And you said, that one. And he says, oh, Holy Ghost, i got to go. Because when the Lord stands up to the devil and he's full of the Holy Ghost, the devil doesn't have a single place to stand if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. And you say this morning, I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. What's that mean? Well, there's more to it than you realize. It's the power of God to live the way he told us to live. It's the anointing of God to live afresh and anew. It's how he said to live the New Testament way. He said, I'm telling you, you take up where I left off. But you can't even want to do that until you're filled with the Holy Ghost. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you say, I want all this and more. I want more. And if you're really longing for that, then you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.